I'm here to argue that we can, maybe, barely, if we're brilliant, if we're lucky, meet Eric's challenge, uh, but especially to argue how to do it. Um, and since this is a conference of economists devoted to new thinking, I'm going to um, challenge at least one of the typical answers to this solution. Um, so this is about what policies work and why and how you design them to make sure they work. Um, before I do that, though, I want to arg uh, offer an alternative to the title of this conference, not Paradigm Lost, which is a nice pun, um, but another one from the last Great Depression, which is going to be Brother Can You Paradigm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Um, let me start by saying that, that uh, to, to make the argument in two sentences, why policy is where we have to focus. Um, the world spends five trillion dollars per year on energy, and an additional six trillion dollars per year on the infrastructure that sets our energy patterns. That's a lot of money. It's a very, I don't remember what fraction that is of the global economy, but it's 20, how much? 10%. 10%. If that money lands on brown choices, we have a dismal carbon future. If that money, existing cash flow, lands on green choices, we're going to be fine. Um, the only way you divert that money from brown choices to green choices is through public policy. If you didn't require public policy, it would have happened already. <laughs> Is, it, is that me? <laughs> okay, I will slow down a little. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know we need policy. Then the question is which one? The, the house religion in most houses is that you put a price on carbon. You tax it or you cap it. And then the free market will take care of the rest. Um, I'm in favor of a carbon price, a carbon tax, if we can get it. But even if we had it, I'm going to argue it's not enough. And it's going to be very hard to get. Um, Carbon tax is politically difficult. I think the only really effective pricing of carbon in the world at scale is the transportation taxes in Europe. I think anything else you can argue is, is too small to have really made a difference. And even there, European governments had to rely on performance standards for cars. Because for reasons which I can get into during Q&A, there are some sectors that do not respond well to a price. Let me take buildings for an example. The developers who decide to put up buildings don't pay the energy bills. Set the carbon price where you want it. They're not going to be that affected. Architects who design buildings don't know anything about carbon prices. Builders who decide where the ducks go and whether to insulate them don't pay attention to carbon prices. Owners of buildings usually don't pay the energy bills. Tenants pay the bills. Tenants don't make any of those decisions. And when you rent a building, or even when you buy a building, a new house, on your list of 10 concerns for that new house, energy is going to be number 11 below schools, below quietness, below affordability, below the fireplace, below all those other concerns. So you can really manipulate the price of carbon and you're not gonna affect the nature of the building. And yet 40% of the world's energy is used in buildings. There are a lot of policy approaches that people have taken to fix buildings. Labeling. How much does your building use compared to your neighbor's buildings? Anybody here know that? A couple, couple of nerds. <laughs> Most people don't. Energy efficient mortgages. Great idea, you get a better mortgage rate. Does it work? Nope. Star programs, lead programs, gold stars, green stars, do they work? None of these ideas have gotten into double digit percentages of affecting building energy performance. One policy has, and that's really good, really strong, really dynamic building codes. California houses use 80% less energy post code compared to pre-code, 80%. That's the kind of curve we need. And California building codes are designed, and I'm going to get into this in a sec, in a way to encourage and to, sell, to encourage new technology and to self-tighten. So they are an example of a brilliant policy design. So how do you design performance standards, and these are the unsung heroes, performance standards, so that they work incredibly well? The first thing is the best performance standards are designed around the sector. Sounds obvious. Building codes affect buildings, and appliance standards affect appliances, and a renewable portfolio standard affects the utilities. When you design a policy around the sector, the energy consuming sector that you're trying to impact, uh, you actually have an, a chance to understand the dynamics of that sector, the technologies, the decision makers. Um, and it, it makes the policy design challenge much easier. It also makes the politics much easier, because the people who decide how utilities operate is the Public Utilities Commission. 
And those people you can identify by name, by statutory constraint, by political inclination, by the economics of their situation, and so on. So you have a much more solvable problem than the generalizable one of trying to create a carbon cap or carbon tax. Again, I'm in favor of those, but we need these, these performance standards. So how do you design a performance standard so that it works? I'm gonna offer the following rules. First of all, sounds obvious, these standards, these regulations should reward performance. They should not specify how to achieve the performance. Um, the Clean Air Act amendments, which were mentioned earlier, uh, typically, but not in all cases, reward performance. Fuel efficiency standards for cars reward performance. Regulators like to specify with prescription how to do something. That's a bad idea because you don't take advantage of the dynamics of the marketplace. So first is reward performance. The second one is make your regulation, make your performance standard dynamic with respect to technology. The Japanese have a neat way of doing it. It's called the top runner system. Um, so the way they set fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks in Japan is they take a snapshot of all the cars on the market today. They divide them into quintiles. They take the top quintile and they say that's the standard for everybody for the next five years, right? And then they do it again in five years. So if you're in that quintile already, you have a market advantage for the first couple of years. If you're not, you have a really good incentive to invent the next thing. Again, California building codes, I'm gonna summarize at the end, do this very well. Um, a lot of performance standards are static with respect to technology and that's a profound problem. The first fuel efficiency standards for cars in the United States were signed into law by President Gerald Ford. The next significant iteration was signed into law by President Barack Obama. That's a long, stupid, plateau, right? We wasted two and a half decades of improvement. Meantime, in those two and a half decades, car power doubled and weight increased 60%. Some of those improvements could have been captured by efficiency instead of a stagnation. So make it dynamic with respect to technologies. That's the second design principle. The third one is to conform your policy timing to product cycles. It seems obvious. We have appliance standards in the US for refrigerators and air compressors and motors and lighting and so on. And our product cycle in the Department of Energy, our standard setting cycle is eight years, even though the product cycle is three years. So we miss one and a half design cycles, one and a half engineering cycles, one and a half factory building cycles, because we're so freaking slow. So you have to conform your performance standards iterations with the timing of the product you're, you're talking about. It's also far cheaper to do things right when they're built. Right? So if you know how many houses are going to be built or how many power plants are going to be built, you really want to focus on those because then you get the improvement for free. Um, how am I doing on time? Do I have a couple more minutes? Three minutes. All right. Because I don't want to leave you with some of these principles unspoken here. Um, the fourth one's simple. Go for 100% of the market. It's amazing how many policies don't do that. The um, U.S. fuel efficiency standards for cars, again, exempted sort of cars and trucks. I mean, sorry, trucks. And so everything got redefined as a truck. Um, if you don't treat 100% of the market, people will game around it. So related to that, there's a whole bunch of ways you can game, but you can design policies badly so that they're easily gained. If you have a performance curve that's part of your policy, make it a curve, don't make it stair steps. Stair steps induce gaming. People, people will crowd to the edges of a threshold because they'll make more money there. Um, Fifth, make your policy signals long-term. When people, and make them certain, when people see a long-term signal and they have confidence in it, they will invest in R&D and they will build factories to meet that. So if you have a renewable portfolio standard, the fraction of your electrons that you have to purchase from renewable sources, that's set at 12% the first year and 13% the next year, and you're quite sure it's gonna go up 1% a year, for three decades, you have just created a fantastic magnet for all the entrepreneurs and all the venture capitalists and so on who want to build windmills and solar and so on. So create long-term signals and make sure there's continuous improvement in those signals. It's back to the don't let the thing plateau or make it dynamic with respect to technology. Long-term signals make achievement of goals far cheaper than short-term signals. So I think it's, I think it's um, self-evident. Um, I don't know if I'm on five or six, but wherever I am, let the markets find the price. I have zero minutes left. Um, let the markets find the price. The feed-in tariff in Germany, I think, was actually brilliant, and I actually would argue to Germans who are tired of paying a lot of money for solar, that you have done more for global development 
for poverty reduction with your feed-in tariff than with all your aid programs in history. So it's been a fantastic investment because you created a clean energy option for the whole world. But strictly speaking from a was this an efficient way to buy down the cost of solar, the answer is no. Instead of setting a price for solar, they should auction off a subsidy for solar. Let the market find the price. It would have been a, you would have got more solar per dollar. So let the market find the price. Um, that'll be the last rule I will put out there. Um, the other stuff we can, I can offer as part of Q&A, should somebody be curious, um, is that there's a small number of these policies, about 10, that really matter. They get you most of the way there. Um, and there's a large number that are either essentially decorative um, or, or interesting, but not that important. So I will conclude with that.